We're going to continue a series on the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to do that next week, and then we're going to be moving into Advent, and your bulletin tells you we're going to do a new theme called Blessed to be a Blessing, and then starting in January, we're going to go into some hot topics, and I'll be dealing with suicide, euthanasia. Uh, Catherine will be doing a message called What Would Jesus Say to Gian Gameshi? We'll be looking at the abuse question, same-sex marriage, so we're going to move into some really um, hot stuff in, uh, in January. But these next two weeks, we want to look at Jesus' well-known teaching that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, 46% of you have heard these first two little vignettes I'm going to tell because I sent them out on my e-news and yesterday at noon, 46% of the people who get it had clicked on it. I could tell how many people do it. And if you don't get it and would like to, just email me at john at saint.a.ca and I'll uh, add you to the list. So uh, here's what I led off with my e-news on, and it was to introduce what I'm about to say. Two stories, both are true. First, during my first year of ministry in May 1978, I left New Brunswick, came back to Toronto, attended the Billy Graham School of Evangelism. Now, Graham was doing a crusade in the spring of 78 at what then was Maple Leaf Gardens and Exhibition Stadium. Some of you here don't know what I'm talking about, but <laughs> others of you will, but I won't date you. So in the evenings, we would go hear Billy Graham, Maple Leaf Gardens or Exhibition Stadium, whichever one it was he was speaking at. And in the daytime at Yorkminster Park Baptist, they had brought in his team, some of the best preachers from across the United States. One of them is the late, great Charles Allen, who was a well-known and loved Methodist preacher from Houston, Texas. And Allen was actually a better preacher than Graham was. That's he just was. And he said a number of things that I still remember uh, 37 years later. He said, for example, ministers should never be ashamed or embarrassed to ask congregations for money. First year out, that's a good thing to hear. <laughs> and he said things about the resurrection that still stay with me. And he also said, and I'm quoting him now, the main job of the church is to teach people to pray. That's one of the main things that Jesus did. Now, second intro, there was a well-known preacher from about 100 years ago, a little less than that, from New York City named Harry Emerson Fosdick. And Fosdick was on his first visit to Niagara Falls. And he was standing over near the brink of the Horseshoe Falls with a friend of his. And the friend said to him, you know, that's the greatest unused power in the world. And Fosdick replied, no, it's not. The greatest unused power is prayer. So I'm calling this, titling this message, The Greatest Power. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations, the thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable, O oh God. Strengthened our Redeemer. Amen. So, there was this minister in a church who always did a children's story. Now, we haven't done that much anymore, but he would call all the little kids down to the front of the church, and he would have some kind of thing to illustrate. So, this particular day, he's got a telephone. So he's got this phone, and the kids gather around him, and he, he's demonstrating the phone and, and saying, well, when you talk on the phone, you're, you're talking to somebody, but you can't see them. And uh, this is long before Skype, and uh, you can't see them, but you can hear them, and they can hear you, and you can communicate with them. And he said, prayer is talking to God like that. You can't see God, and uh, but... Uh, you can communicate with him and you can listen to him and, and he'll uh, listen to you. And there's one little kid, of course, pipes up and says, well, what's his number? <laughs> Some of us 
sometimes sort of forget God's number. Another story before we get into the serious stuff. Um, these two fishermen were out, had a little boat in a big lake. And storm, violent thunderstorm came up very, very suddenly. They're trying to get to shore, but it looks like they're going to capsize and not going to make it. And got to do something. And one of them says, all right, I'm going to pray. Dear God, listen, I haven't bothered you for 15 years. But if you could just help us out here, I won't bother you for another 15 <laughs> Check in Gallup poll, apparently 80% of North Americans pray once a week. Approximately 50% pray daily. And 90% pray occasionally. They didn't say what occasionally was, whether it was every 15 years or once in a blue moon, but that's what they that said. And there's nobody who knows more about prayer than Jesus. And in the scripture passage from the Sermon on the Mount that Nancy read, he is giving us some instruction on how we can connect with God, how we can get God's number, if you want. And Jesus, interestingly, takes it for granted that people will pray. So verse 5, he doesn't say, if you pray, he says, when you pray. Verse 6, same thing again. When you pray, not if you pray. Verse 7, I don't have it up on the screen, but it's the same thing again. When you pray, not if you pray. So the issue with Jesus is not whether or not you pray, but the issue is where you pray, what you pray, and why. Why is always the big one. So the first advice Jesus says is when you pray, pray secretly. Verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, so that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I tell you, they have their reward. Now, the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the day, loved to pray in two places, in the synagogue, which was the church, and on the street corner. And the reason is that that's where people gather. And some of them were rather clever, because every afternoon, there would be a, a trumpet blow when it was time for prayers, just to remind people. And if you're in the Middle East, within the Muslim tradition, there's still, uh, it's not a trumpet, but a, a horn that blows, reminding people to, to turn to Mecca. And uh, so what they would do is, uh, they, they knew the time roughly, they would get on the busiest street corner when it was time, so that lots of people would see them doing their daily prayers. Now, Jesus, to be clear, was not condemning public prayer. That's not what he was saying. Uh, lots of us have had many opportunities to pray publicly. I, I often do in the mayor's prayer breakfast. I seem to be do, do that almost every year. When the Newtown shootings happened a couple of years ago, there was a uh, service down at City Hall, and I was asked to come and, and lead some prayers there. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus prayed publicly himself, even as he was dying on the cross. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost in what was a public prayer meeting. So he's not condemning prayers in and of themselves. He's condemning the desire to be seen to pray publicly. There's a story about a young lawyer just opened a brand new office. He was sitting behind his brand new desk, eagerly awaiting his first client. He heard some footsteps in the hall and a hand on the doorknob. He wanted to look important, so he pretended to be busy. As the man was about to walk in, he, he had picked up his phone and uh, pretended to have a conversation, said, I'll have my secretary get to that as soon as I can understand I have a very heavy schedule. He motioned to the door to beckon the man in and said, I do appreciate your calling, call back in a few days, and if I can take your case, I will. And he hung up the phone. He went to uh, see his first new client. He said, now what can I do for you? The man says, I'm from the phone company, I'm here to hook up your phone. <laughs> G 
Jesus said there was some people whose public prayers were like that. They were doing it for somebody else, and nobody was on the other end of the line. Verse 6, when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The reason the secret place is important to God is because when we're in that place, there's no applause, nobody's listening, God himself. There's no awards or plaques, just you and God. Secondly, as you pray, pray sincerely, sincerely. Jesus goes a step further. He says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard by their many words. Jesus is talking about a couple of things here. One of them is rote praying, just saying words that you're not meaning or thinking out, using worn-out cliches, saying things you've heard other people say without putting any heart behind it. That's the real issue, the heart behind it. little girl went over to her grandmother's house to spend the night. Next morning, the grandma says to her, well, did you see your prayers last night? The little girl says, no, Grandma, I didn't. She said, Grandma says, why not? She said, well, I got down on my knees to pray, but I got thinking that God's probably tired of hearing the same old prayer every night. So I just crawled into bed and told him about Little Red Riding Hood. Now, sometimes we may just want to tell God about Little Red Riding Hood, and that's saying the same thing over and over. I didn't put this up on the screen. I, I really should have. John Bunyan, the great Christian from a century or so ago said, when you pray, it would be better to let your heart be without words than to let your words be without heart. When you pray, it would be better to let your heart be without words than to let your words be without heart. God hears what comes out of the, the heart. And prayers don't need to be long, Jesus said, you know. You don't need a lot of words. Sometimes the shortest ones are the most honest, like this short prayer. Lord, help me be the person my dog thinks I am. <laughs> Animal lovers here today. Yeah. Doesn't have to be long. And then Jesus goes on in verse 8. Therefore, be, do, do not be like them. Your Father knows the things you have before you ask him. God already knows what we need. We don't have to inform him of anything. Sometimes we don't realize that. There's a story about a man who was at a conference in Pennsylvania. The conference director asked him to pray. There had been an airplane crash, and he wanted to pray for the family who had survived it, but he couldn't recall the location of the crash. So he said, Lord, bless the plane crash out there in, out there in, out there in. Oh, you know where it was. You read the morning paper. Well, God is all-knowing, but he doesn't need the morning paper. But he knows what we need, and we talk to him secretly, sincerely, and simply. And then Jesus gives some direction in what we've come to know and call the Lord's Prayer. And in verse 9, this is a model prayer. Jesus starts by saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, before bringing our wish list to God, God, remember this, this, and this, first thing we need to do is thank him for who he is. Thank him for who he is, what he's done, what he's doing. It's almost impossible to praise God and be depressed at the same time. It lifts our hearts. And then Jesus Next point about prayer is that it's okay to pray for personal needs. In the Lord's Prayer, we're taught to pray, give us this day our daily bread. That means more than just bread. It refers to our daily needs. Clean air, clothing, housing, a job, good sleep at the end of the day, all of those kinds of things. It's okay to bring personal needs before God. That's not being selfish. And then Jesus goes on. One of his main points, he says, uh, pray forgive us our sins or trespasses. We use here, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Unforgiven sin is like dirt in a carburetor, spiritual carburetor. In order to keep our lines clear, we need to be forgiven. The only thing God really prevents him forgiving is us asking. There was a leader in the resistance in the Netherlands against the Nazis back at the time of the Second World War. Her name was Corrie Ten Boom. She survived the war and uh, told a lot of stories about it. Her entire family was sent to a Nazi concentration camp because they were known and had been found out for harboring Jews uh, when the um, Nazis uh, invaded. Her sister and her father died in that camp. After the war, uh, Corrie Ten Boone, who survived, began to speak to church groups uh, all over Europe. Often she talked about the need for forgiveness, which was so, so important in the aftermath of World War II in Europe. And one evening in Munich, she looked out over the audience, and to her dismay, on the fourth row was a former SS officer who had caused a lot of pain for Corey and her sister who had died. He had been a particularly cruel guard. Corey gave her talk that evening, and afterward, he approached her, thanked her for her talk, and said, Fraulein, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. I was a guard there. Since that time, I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips. Fraulein, would you forgive me? He extended his hand. Corey said her own hand was frozen at her side at that moment. It just, she couldn't lift it up to shake hands with the man. She said a silent prayer. Still, her, <coughs> her hand wouldn't move. She was getting a little embarrassed. So she prayed again, Dear Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your strength, please. And that moment of force greater than her allowed her to lift her hand. She said, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. With God's help, we can forgive even the unforgivable. Now, that may take some time. It may not be obvious. It doesn't mean that we forget. Uh, memories will still be there. But there can be forgiveness and some release. So I want to do, uh, to close off the sermon, seven practical tips, seven practical tips. I'm going to take them one by one. They'll be up on the screen. This uh, is going to hopefully reinforce the drama that we saw a few moments ago. Number one, keep a daily appointment with God. Best to find a quiet place. Turn off your cell phone if you have that on your side all the time. Read a few verses of scripture, pray. Uh, it's good to have a notebook, maybe not quite like the woman in the drama, a spiral one so the pages won't fall out, I don't know. But the thing is that it's daily. Second, thank God for three specific blessings in your life. Don't just say, for all the blessings, I am grateful. Name them. Maybe you like crisp November mornings. Maybe you don't, so leave that one off. It depends. <laughs> Maybe the smile somebody gave you at the grocery store. Name them. As a matter of fact, let's pause for a moment. Let's do that. I'm just going to take a moment. Would you bow your heads and name three specific blessings in your life? Amen. Third, I'm going to take some time on this one too. Confess one specific failing or sin. Again, name it. Ask God to forgive and change you. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and may be trusted to forgive us from any kind of wrong. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, as that text says. Just pause.
So bow your heads. Name one specific failing or sin. Ask God to forgive you and change you. Amen. Fourth, some of you have been around a while, you're going to know what I'm about to say. Pray for at least three other persons. If you have a book, you need to write the names down. I mean, don't write down now. We're going to do that in a moment, including, and this is something I've challenged before on, find somebody you think there may not be anybody who prays for that person. and Make that one of the three people. Uh, that you pray for. And uh, later sometime you can write it down. Let's pause. Pray for three other persons. Amen. Fifth, share with God one of your own personal needs. We just talked about that. That's okay to talk to God about specific things for ourselves. And uh, yeah, write it down. Eventually you're going to need a book to do this. I do tell people I'm going to pray for them. I always write it down. I'm 62. I mean, I usually pray immediately when I say that, but if I don't write it down, I forget. I forget, so write them down. Um, so yeah, let's just pause. One of your own personal needs. Amen. Number six, ask God to fully activate the Holy Spirit within you in the next 24 hours so that you'll have the wisdom and power to be an effective disciple. Why only 24 hours? Refer back to one. Keep a daily appointment with God. Keep doing that. You only have to do it for 24 hours because you'll be asking again and again each day. So let's just pause and would you do that? To ask God for the next 24 hours to activate his Holy Spirit within you you see, the moment that you invited Jesus to be Savior and Lord, his Holy Spirit took up residence in your heart and mind. But if we get so self-confident that we don't intentionally seek his power, he's not going to force wisdom or peace or patience upon us. But Jesus did say, if you then, though you are evil, know how to good give, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So let's pause and ask the Holy Spirit to be present with us 24 hours. Amen. And seventh and last, pray for St. Andrews United Church you're visiting from somewhere else, you fill in the blank, make it your own church. None of us here are smart enough or righteous enough to guide the church, but the Lord will if we let him. Let's pause it. Would you pray for our church? Amen. Several years ago, a great renowned British preacher named Leslie Weatherhead told a story about an elderly Scottish man. He was quite ill. The minister came to see the dying man. He noticed that there was an empty chair beside the bed. The older man said, let me tell you about that chair. Many years ago, I found it difficult 
to pray. So one day, I shared my problems with my pastor, and he suggested that I just sit down, put a chair in front of me, and imagine God sitting there in that chair, and then just talk to him like I would talk to a trusted friend. It's worked for me. I've been doing that ever since that chair stays beside my bed. Some days later, the daughter of the sick man called the minister to tell him that her father had died peacefully. And then she said, for some reason, his hand was on the empty chair alongside his bed. Isn't that strange? The minister said, no, no, it's not strange at all. I understand perfectly. He was just reaching out in trust to his best friend. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, you have given us the privilege of coming before you. Help us to do it regularly, daily, and to do it simply and sincerely. You know our hearts, and we want our hearts to be open to you and for you. Amen.